Hey, somebody needs to wash the dog. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You're listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. The Professional Notice is sponsored this week by WisdomHarbor.com. For less than $3 a month, you'll have access to original content that will have a positive effect on your family, and that includes your little kids, teenagers, and adult children. Dave Ramsey says that it is also great for your businesses and your teams. Utilizing video, audio, and the written word, content is delivered in small bites by Grammy winners, CEOs, comedians, master chefs, best-selling authors, and Hall of Fame speakers. There are even guitar lessons from an award-winning songwriter. Check it out today and join your friends and neighbors who are already part of wisdomharbor.com. Observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And of course, we love it when somebody comes to the table with both. I have an old friend with me today and you know, I, I don't have many friends who, who are on the list. Uh, well, I, I guess he's the only friend that I have who's on the list of Steven Spielberg and Oprah's favorite movie producer because Steven Spielberg and Oprah both said that this guy's movie was the best animal movie they had ever seen. I have... Benji's dad, Joe Camp. <laughs> Joe, good to see you. More or less, we'll say. <laughs> it is, uh, you know, it's very true, though. It is Benji's dad because nobody knows who Joe Camp is. Well, I, I tell you what, you you did you did five movies. Your your son did one, and right, and the, you know the the original movie Benji, that just like took over. I mean, it was one of those, uh, uh, can you just briefly tell us about this, the story behind that? Well, the, the the real story behind it is that before it did that, it was turned down by every studio in Hollywood at the finished movie. You know, we finished it. We were proud of it. We'd screened it. Everything was great. And so we go out to screen it for all the studios out there and every one of them all the way down the list, turned it down. And within almost a year later, it was the number three picture of the summer. So it, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a story because we wound up having to do it all ourselves in order to get it done. Well, and then you, you do it all yourself. Ben, Benji got to eat all the dog food too. <laughs> so, so and, and when, when we came back, when we came back from, from Hollywood, I was in the dumps. I mean, I was really down low because I, what are we going to do? We can throw it in the trash or figure it out. And, and we decided that figuring it, figuring it out was going to be the best route. And so that's what we did. We just bought, you know, bit the bone, so to speak, and uh, formed a distribution company and off we went and the entire, uh, uh, distribution on the movie was done from our little office there in Dallas. Wow. And you, you have moved now. You are in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, south of Nashville, right? Right. right. Do, do you know um, Russ and Lori Taff? Who? Russ and Lori Taff. No, I, I don't. I, you know, and I know everybody said you, you, you moved to a small town. Somebody knows somebody in a small town. They say, do you know? And I know there's like probably 5,000 people in Bell Buckle, but I am going to make sure that... 500 people is more like it. Really? Okay. Well, I've, I've got some other friends other than you and your lovely wife, and I'm going to make sure that you guys meet each other. So We kind of ramped through Los Angeles. I was, in, I was out there, there for nine years, and uh, we, we, we finally decided that we needed to get out of Taxifornia. So Kathleen, who was born there, <laughs> and... Uh, her heel marks are still all the way across the country. You know, wow! Back, but but it's a it's a great little place, and we're at the end of a, a 
a road that ends in our garage, actually, and uh, got about 31 acres here and paying less taxes on it than we were for four out there in California. So wow. we're good. Wow. And, well, and, and eight horses on it, living like horses ought to live. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is the uh, this is the swing to our conversation today. <clears throat> After making five Benji movies, with Benji all the way through Oh Heavenly Dog, and your your son making a Benji movie, somehow you got hooked on bigger animals, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I didn't have I learned I learned early on with the the Benji movie when we finally I mean, the, the, the way the whole thing started was my wife and I had been watching one of those Disney shows and they were showing clips from the various movies way back before they were, there was any video around. Right. And then they showed a clip from Lady and the Tramp. And, uh, you know, I, I was asking her when we went in the kitchen to do the dishes, do you think it'd be possible to do that kind of a movie with a real dog? And we talked about it for a while and finally came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be possible because you, how do you tell a story without words? And uh, so we kind of put it to bed. She went to bed and I stayed up to read and our little Yorkshire Terrier, whose name was Benji, and uh, he stayed up with me. And I kind of got intrigued with watching his expressions on things. I'd do silly little things or he'd hear a siren down the street or a dog barking next door. And his expressions were small and changed, but they did change. And so I got down on the floor and got in the corner and was, you know, all huddled up and acting afraid. And, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? And the dog's looking at me like, have you lost your mind? And you could read that in his, in his face. And so I went to bed knowing the dogs do talk. And when I woke up the next morning, it's when I pushed aside, I was worried before going to my real job at an advertising agency, I was writing for a couple of, couple of hours each morning and, and I pushed it aside and wrote the entire, the entire treatment for that first movie that morning and took it into, to my wife and said, I want to read this to you and did. And when I looked over at her, she was like this. And I said, yes, yes, <laughs> I think we got it. And we got it by by depicting what the animal was feeling, not what the animal was doing. And, you know, I was reminded of an old Lassie movie where you had Lassie under a tree and on top, you know, in the tree, there was a bobcat or, or something that was, you know, evil for the dog. And the uh, concept was the, the cat was supposed to scream and the dog was supposed to, oh my gosh. And, you know, the, the, the cat screamed and the dog went, you know, like that because there was a trainer call in the dog to get the look. And that's all it was to it. And I held that up on the wall, so to speak, you know, throughout the whole thing, because that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to get down into the heart of the dog and learning that is what also took me through that, that whole horse thing is because we, it's, it's emotional. It's not, it's not intellectual. And uh, we uh, uh, went into it beginning, at, you know, with the emotion of the horse and why you should not be, taking care of horses the way we were told to take care of them when we first got them. Now, your first, your first book was a big bestseller. It's called The Soul of a Horse. The Soul of a Horse. Yeah. The Soul of a Horse. And what? And why did you write that book? Why did you, I mean, you, you well, were uh, known, yeah, it, you're it, known it took, around the world as a dog person, and now you're writing took, The Soul it, of a Horse. It took a lot of gall because <laughs> I was, you know, we were not a year into owning horses. When I finally told her, but we'd go in and we'd talk every night, you know, about, you know what I found out today and when I learned that this and that and something else is wrong with the way we're doing it. And uh, and Kathleen, you know, finally said, well, you know, we, we got to figure out how to get it out to the people. And so literally our our first horses, I don't think they were seven, eight months old 
when I started writing the book, and I said, well, I got more gall than everybody in, in the country <laughs> because it's, uh, it took that to really start writing a book about what you should do with horses when we had never, we had no clue eight months before. And, uh, and so sure enough, that's what it, what it turned out to be. And, and working from the, the position of the horse is what really got us well into it because the relationship that we had with, with our, I mean, the, the, our first horse decided on his own to make me his leader effect in effect. He, he sat, decided to trust me. And, and, and in a way, I mean, another thing that really got us ginning and inspired over the thing is, is that trust came from somebody who was just like we are with God. You know, that's all God wants from us is trust, complete and total trust. And then he'll take it from there. You know, the, you know, the story about the, the, the guy who says, I'll figure out how to do this and I'll make the plan myself while God's laughing his head off. Yeah, because, yeah. Because it's, it's, <laughs> no, and that's the way the entire movie thing went is, is, you know, I thought we were going to go this way and we sure enough went that way. And two of the worst times in my entire life had to be there exactly as they were for the, the movie thing to be a success. So it tell, was, tell me, do you mind telling me? No, it, it, the the first one was I wanted to go to UCLA, and and the, before actually you know getting involved with the dog movies, I just wanted to be in the movies and you know do take TV shows or whatever, and uh, uh, I got turned down by that much of a grade point because. I had played some one of the sophomores in sophomore years in college, which is a sophomore semester. And uh, so I did not get to go to UCLA, had to go around the world to get into the movie thing, eventually did, and nobody wanted to finance the movie. So we did it ourselves and raised the money separately and, and uh, you know, got the whole movie made and then took the movie out there to, to Hollywood and turned down by every studio in, in the lot. And both of those things had to happen exactly as they happened. I almost gave it up both times because, of, you know, what's the point? You know, when you can't even get the education you want or you can't even, the movie, you know, the, the, the movie was on the floor, you know, literally. And uh, so I had to buckle down and, and figure it out. But when I did, you know, I, I, I finally began, you know, he had to slap me around a little bit. God did. But I, I, I finally began to get the, the picture that, okay, he's in charge, not me. And pay attention when these things happen. They happen for a reason. And the reason it happened is that had we gone to L.A., I would have probably been in, you know, sitcoms or something, before, you know, before it was over with. But we stayed in Dallas and we worked this out, worked on the movie, we raised the money for it. And he says, and, and it's going to be good. It's going to be good. You're going to do well with it. And and so, believe it or not, we did. And the, and the same thing was kind of true with the horses. You know, I, I talk here. You talk all the time about how many rejections you got, and we got this. Uh, we got barrels full of these things, both from agents and from publishers themselves. And th we had a friend that we had stopped. This friend in Idaho. He's a vet, and he's he's been on. Uh, Good Morning America is a recurring vet and that sort of thing. And he's done some of those, uh, uh, what do they call them? The, the soul of, soul of chicken soup for the soul. Right, chicken. right. Okay, okay. He's done a bunch of those for dogs and horses. You know, there's a whole bunch of different titles on it. And anyway, he, he, uh, we got to know him simply because he was doing a radio interview over the, you know, over the phone. And, uh, and he called and said, would you guys mind coming up 
while we were in the promotional period, you know, and going from Chicago, Chicago to New York to here and there, but big, big towns and trying to make noise with the, the movie. And he said, uh, he said, why don't y'all come up and do a, 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 a show for us here and, and it'll benefit the local uh, rescue operation. And I said, well, how many people are there? And he said, we got 2,400 here. And and, and Sandpoint, we could do that one. And you, you, you got about 5,000 people down there. <laughs> and so I called Kathleen. I said, well, what you? I mean, that's we don't have a whole lot of time, you know, to get to every place we got to get to before the movie comes out. And she says, I know, I know. I said, well, anyway, we talked ourselves into it. And so I'm in Seattle doing promo stuff. And then uh, Chicago was the first of the week. And so I fly into to Spokane. She flies up to Spokane. We rent a car go up to his place and spend two days up there doing those tours and living with them. And they had horses and that kind of, you know, rubbed us right the first time. But uh, when it came to the agent situation, you know, he is, he's done several really, really good books. They haven't done too well, but they're really good about relationships with the people and the, and the animal, uh, right. mostly, mostly dogs. And uh, uh, so I, you know, I, I had read those and I, you know, he, he's just a really, really good writer. And so we were going forward from there and he gets into this thing about the things we, we go and we do the two shows that he wanted to do. And he was forever grateful and we were too just because it was fun and it was small and it was nice and we did it and then i went to chicago and kathleen went back home to living in los angeles at the time and uh, uh and from chicago we went on around around the world on the benji movie and the, and the benji movie you know did not do uh, the first three Benji movies were in the top 10% of box office grosses for the year. And this was number five, I guess. And it just didn't happen. It's one of the best movies I think that we've done. It's called Benji off the leash, but it, it didn't happen. And I was in the dumps again. I was really down low. Kathleen comes in and says, I got to do something. I got to do something. What am I going to do? And and we had just moved into a house down in Upper San Diego County in a place called Valley Center. And right. We just moved moved out of Dana Point where we had been and got a nicer house down there for less money and uh, had some room and there were some a couple of stalls out there. You know, open stalls just little half a roof or something, but a pen. And and we get to talking about wouldn't it be nice if there were some horses down there walking around in the stalls because they're looking west over the mountains at the sunset and the ocean and all of that. And so I said, you know, yeah, that would that would, that would be nice actually. And uh she she uh took that as a cue and for my birthday, she comes in and says, get up, get out of bed, get your clothes on. And I said, well, what, what, what's happening? She said, just do it. Get in the car. <laughs> we're going. I said, well, where are we going? So we go down the hill and go around back into the boondocks. And there's a, a, a vet place back there and a, and a rescue operation. I said, you know, we got enough dogs. We had four dogs at the time. Said, we got enough dogs. We don't, we don't need another dog. And uh, she says, okay, and drove and went right into this thing. And there was a big horse trailer with three horses all saddled. And she said, happy birthday. You've been talking about horses now for however long, and you're going to climb on this one, and we're going to go out for five or six hours. And we did. 
we went out on this trail ride for five, six hours. She was petrified. I had no idea that she was petrified. <laughs> and it took me six months to learn that she was really afraid of horses at the time. <laughs> but she was doing all of this to get us in, into something other than you get take my mind off of the, the Benji movie that didn't do well. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I got into that and she took us on this trail ride. We went. And three weeks later, we had, we owned three horses. I mean, literally, and I can promise you that a nice trail ride is not a good good reason to own three horses. And, uh, and so that was, that was the start of it. And what, what really came to pass with the soul of a horse was that everything we were told, you know, oh, you, you got to do it this way. Why? Because it's always been done. That's that's the way they've that's always done. That's the way done. it's done. Yeah, that's yeah. the way it's done. And, and you just do it that way. And so uh, we would do it, and we would put them in the stalls down there and, and the whole thing. And you know, they were not happy about it. We knew that. And so the more we got into it, and my horse came to us with shoes on the front feet and none on the back feet. Well, that didn't make any sense because most people were arguing that the, the genetics of the wild horse, which has no shoes, has changed with all the, the changing that they've done, which is you know a few thousand years only that they've done. And so I, when I got deep into the research and got beyond horses, just into the science of it, the, the research was saying that it takes longer than than uh, a few thousand years to change the base genetics of anything. But the horses in the wild are basically genetically exactly the same as the horses out here in our pasture. And the way most horses are kept and cared for is in a 10 by 10 stall. And you know, that's the starting point. And when I came to a point of our horse having two shoes and not two shoes, I, I said, why? I mean, does front end, you know, have the concrete to deal with and the back end doesn't, what's the deal there? And so did enough research on it. I said, that's it. I called the vet and I said, shoot them all. He said, which one? I said, all six of them. He said, whoa, whoa, don't you want to wait and kind of do it one at a time and see how it works? I said, no, it's coming off all of them. And literally within a few months, you know, the shoes were off of all the horses. They were walking better than they've ever walked before. And that, that's the kind of land that the wild horse has grown up on out there in, in California. And right. San Diego County. You know, high desert. And it, uh, it's, so that, that, that was the start of it. And then the shoes came off and the stalls went away and we began to get paddocks that were, you know, roughly the size of a barn, but no barn for them to live in on their own. And then it got bigger and went down a hill. And then when we came over here, they now have 20 acres to, to be on. And they're and so totally this, the, open. The, sub, the subtitle is Life Lessons from the Herd. Yeah. <clears throat> so you became part of their herd. Yeah. And, and, and the lessons that we learned from them uh, show up intermingled in this, in this book. And, uh, and, and, and it's, there's a double, double, uh, there's a, a short story parable that are just the wild horses. And, you know, each chapter is three, four pages long. And then there's what we're doing and learning about what, the, those wild horses are all about and why right. and what's right. going on. And it kind of goes that way all the way through the book. There's, there's the wild horse story and then there's the our learning story and how aghast we were that, what? You're, you're kidding me. How can that be? Right. How can there that many people be that wrong about what's going on? Because our horses right now live totally without 
halters, without ropes, in the pasture, no stalls. We don't even have a stall in the barn. We turned them all into work places and storage places and whatnot. And they have access to the to the, the uh, uh, breezeway and to the side shed and to both big pastures. All at one time, so they can do whatever they want to do. And 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 now we have turned their training. Probably, I guess, seven eight years ago, we turned their training into just total totally uh, training at liberty. In other words, they have no halters, no ropes, no anything. They come. Do you ride them? Call. Do you ride them? We we did. We haven't ridden much in the last couple of years, and haven't ridden at all. I guess in the last year, just you know, I'm getting old. And <laughs> you ain't old. But, but it never was the big thing with me. We we had a date in California where we would go every Thursday and eat a picnic lunch, and our two horses would come and eat with us and eat the apple while we ate the sandwich and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and you get to know them really, really well. And, and people ask me if they're happier, you know, if these horses are happier than it would be in the wild. And I say, it's kind of like us. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think there's a yes or a no answer to that question because, you know, they, they have moved from the, their location from the wild into something that is similar to the wild, but now they have us to, to mediate with and to talk to and to get by. And they, and they, have, they have a lot of fun because I have, we, we, we don't do negative reinforcement, which is what most trainers do, which is I'm going to I'm going to pull this rope on you until it's uncomfortable so that you do what I ask you to do. And when you do, I'll release the rope. And that's your reward. And I'm not sure that I have ever seen the horse that goes to bed saying, I hope somebody treats me poorly in the morning so that my reward will be when they quit. (laughs) 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 So it doesn't, doesn't much happen. And so I was riding furiously and, and uh, got through with it, very happy with it, and very proud. And the, uh, uh, it wasn't working. So I, I called up uh, our friend in Idaho because he had done a lot of books with the, you know, the, the uh, various things that he's done, and, and they're good ones. And he's got a good agent in New York, and typical New York. And that's the reason he said, I, this guy's so New York, you're not going to get along. <laughs> and I said, I said that's, that you don't seem to understand the point here. The point is, I got a book and it's not going anywhere. Yeah. And uh, literally, he said, Joe, sit down, shut up. And I had called it, ask him a question. Somebody had written me a a, 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 a a small time agent somewhere had written and wanted to do this and that and something else. And so I called and said, does this sound right to you? I mean, I mean, I, the first day he's, he reads it, he wants to go out with it. He doesn't, he's in a little town somewhere. He hasn't got a big book anywhere in sight. And, uh, he, you know, the guy in Idaho. Kind of, kind of sounds like a movie producer I once heard of. <laughs> well, the guy in Idaho said, Joe, sit down and shut up and don't do anything else. You're going to make a muck of this. Let me call, let me call David and see if he's interested. And if he is, who knows what's going to happen. If he's not, you'll find out about it really quick. And so this was like five o'clock at night. And I don't, have you seen Julie and Julia? The movie? Oh, so. oh, Julia, so. Julie and Julia? You got to go see that. I mean, okay. it's got big stars in it, and 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 it's Julia Childs, and today a blogger who blogs her book. Oh, okay, okay. And and it, and it goes back, and it's really good. But but the end of the movie is when she finally gets her book published, and it was a it was a venture just like yours and just like mine. It, it took forever to to get it done. And so, anyway, I, I, I call him. He says, sit down, shut up. So I did. 
And the next thing I heard from him, I mean, literally within the hour, was he wants to see it. I mean, it was ready to go. So I sent, you know, I think a copy of the book and the presentation and the whole thing up to him. And an hour later, we're eating dinner now and we're just nervous and knowing what's going to happen. An hour later, the, an email comes back from him with a copy of the email from the agent in New York. And it just said, Joe Camp's a genius. And that's all it was it. Wow. And I said, yay, but what? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and and he finally, that same night, you know, worked it out, said, you know, let's get the paperwork done and, and you get on up here. He had 15 publishers want to read it and talk about it. And most of them pulled out before it was over with. And the last two on the list that were making bid offers was the uh, top two in the country, you know, wow. and uh, uh, Barbara Collins and, and they've changed your name so often. I don't, Random, I don't. Random House. Right. Yeah. They do, don't they? And, uh, and so, yeah, he took it. And, and it, literally inside of a couple of weeks, had meetings set up at both those places. And we went up, did the meetings. They bought the book and then broke the news to me that it was about two-thirds the length of what it needed to be. <laughs> so right. I needed yeah. to yeah. write There's another always third. something they don't like. Yeah. And but so I your, did. New, your new and, book. And, and, and like normal, it's one of the, you know some of the best stuff in the book. It's the stuff I didn't want to go back and do. Right. But your new book is Love Your Horse First. Say again? Your new book is Love Your Horse First. Yeah, yeah. Tell I me stole about that. that literally from a, a, a T-shirt that I saw that says, Love Your Horse Before the Sport. And I thought that was so appropriate. I didn't want to title the book that way, but Love Your Horse First is, is, is really good. And that's what the whole thing is about. And it's for, it's, the subtitle is for beginners only. But... It is a tongue-in-cheek subtitle because, I mean, yes, it's for beginners, but it's also for anybody who wants to start doing it right. Wow. It the way so it is it available be. now? Yes. It's, All right. it's about a week ago. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we will, we will put people on this. What can they expect to learn? And what, what can people that they may be, maybe they don't have a horse, but they want to learn about horses and want to learn this these methods. What what can they get from this book, Joe? Well, that's that's the greatest person <clears throat> to get is, is somebody who is that new and can learn how to do it what we call the proper way. No stalls, no shoes, no sugar in their diet, and etc. And and this book really pretty much says everything that we've learned for the, the past 17 years in one book for that, for that beginner or the person who wants to look twice at how they're dealing with it and, and go from there because it's, it's, we refer to a lot of the horses these days as motorcycles. Because it's it's something that you know the owner sees once a week when she goes to ride in the event, and everything else is taken care of in a stall by the uh, you know the person who is running the stall and running the, right. the show and so forth. And, and a lot of the people you know just don't care. You know they they say I, that this is what it's here for. This horse is here for me. Well, my fa my favorite horse lady, Foncy Bullard, down here in Point Clear, Alabama, she's going to love this book because she's all day, every day with her horses. That's great. That's great. And, and what we like to do is, if she, if she hasn't done it already, is to get it into a uh, at-liberty situation because nothing's better than to have eight horses 
twice a day, you go down to feed them and they have to be in a certain spot because if they're not, they're going to eat somebody else's food or the, somebody else is going to eat theirs, you know? So they, they all have to be kind of away. Uh, and, and, you know, this one eats fast, this one eats slow, and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and whoever, we, we have a thing called no agenda time where we go down, there's one horse that is a Mustang that came to us right out of the wild. And, I was so young in the business you know, new in the business that I've made some terrible mistakes with it. And it, it has taken an enormous amount of time to get rid of the fright. It's, I mean, that that's built in, you know, these are, these horses are all, every horse is a flight animal because that horse is, has no way to defend itself, you know, but run. And and it's a it's a big large rabbit or whatever you want to say about it. And it, and, and so it, the, the idea is that it you know that you get next to that horse and you don't make it or try to make it trust you. I mean, a, a lot of the trainers say, you know, yeah, the first thing you want to do is to make this horse respect you. What does that indicate? Just saying those words, make this horse respect you. That you're gonna set, you're gonna do something that makes the horse afraid of you. That triggers that 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 quotient of, of fear, and then it's never gonna work because once the horse has that in its system, then you know, it's not going to work I mean, because it's just going to cover everything up and, and do what you has to do to protect itself. Wow. And, and so concept was a new, a newbie coming in and reading this book. I mean, it, I, I think it's very hard to read this book because a lot of it is, is from here, you know, not from here. Some of it's from here because it has to be, but you get, you get on that side of the horse right from the beginning and you got somebody who's going to try. I mean, it changes dramatically when they trust you before you do, before you trust anything, they trust you. Then everything changes and it literally does. Everything changes and, and, and they become, you know, they, they try harder. And, and, and so we, we went to the, you know, I said, you do something we like and we'll do something you like. And that's the philosophy. And that's do you what find I've that this, Do you find this method works with other animals other than just horses? Sure, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm taking it and stealing it from dogs, you know, because that's what we're doing. I mean, I, we teach the same thing to the, to the horse that we, you know, we always taught the dogs concepts. You know, that, that, uh, give me your foot. Okay. The other foot. Okay. And, and then what happens is you can say, hey, go to the chair. No, the other chair, which other chair? Oh, that, okay. Fine. And, and it just gets, you know, bigger, bigger and they understand it. And with Benji, you had to do that because half of what we thought we were going to try to go for when we get out to the location, which is really in the woods and it's raining or whatever, you know, and you, you got to keep going and you got to shoot. You need the dog to be able to think and to act on that thinking and to listen to you and to make sense out of it rather than I just go from point A to point B. I get the ball here and I give it to somebody over here. And that's what 90% of the, the movie animal, the movie dogs do. Right. But you yeah. can see You can see some of the trained dogs on television shows. You can see them looking at the trainer off screen. Instead yeah, of the, yeah. where they're supposed to be looking. I mean, even when they get close-ups, you know, the dog is still looking over the shoulder or something. Right. The thing. And, and so that was one of the requirements on Benji is that the dog be independent. I mean, Benji would look at that trainer sometimes, and I, I, I would swear that he's not going to do what we wanted him to do. And then he does. <laughs> because he he's was, okay, I've... You know, I'll do it, but I'm going to do it on my time. 
And when I want to, the way I want to, is that okay with you? <laughs> and off we off we would go. But it's uh I think yeah. that's how that I think that so translated in those Benji's Benji movies because we weren't just seeing we weren't just seeing a dog that was performing Lassie and Flipper and Gentleman tricks. It, you know, it, it, Benji was looking into the camera, and we, and we were able to look in. It, it, it was like we were able to form a relationship with that dog. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's what the whole thing was about. It was about showing how the dog would feel. If the dog were, I mean, an actor recreates a situation so that his emotions will be real when, when it goes out there. I mean, a good actor does that. And that's what we were doing with the dog. So you, we were helping the dog to recreate the situation. And if it was such a situation that it would be harmful to the dog in order to do it, then we'd find another way. For example, uh, there are shots in there of a dog that's got to really be neat, mean and nasty and show teeth and all of that. And that dog just happened to bark in a manner that went, you know, when he, uh, when they did it. And so, you know, when you're up there with the camera shoved down his throat, you know, it, it looks really mean, but his tail's just going crazy. <laughs> but you don't show the tail going right, crazy. Right, 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 right. And so that's, that's you know, that's the concept. And it's the same concept with the, you know, with the horses down here that uh, I keep looking off because I can see the, the barn from here. And uh, that, that when, when you work at Liberty, that adds to the trust factor a lot because you've got to trust them while they're trusting you. And they realize that. And they realize that, and 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 the vocabulary that some of ours have a really really good vocabulary, and some of them have a vocabulary, but it's not that good because I haven't spent the time with them. When you got eight of them, and uh, you know, you make the rounds, I mean, they all know how to smile. You know, you do this, and you go, and and that, and they learn that stuff, and they come up. Now they come up and say. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not going there. We're not going there. And then they do something else and they do something else. And, okay, I'll be fine here. <laughs> but that's it. That's the concept is you do something we like and we'll do something you like, which is not the concept of the normal training. The normal training is he's not going to like it, but he's going to do what you want because you're going to make him do it. Well, and- we've, we found in so many areas of life that the way things are done – Will work, but the way things are done are often not the best. And and so I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being with us today. We want to turn people on to your books and to, in touch. How can we keep in touch with you, Joe? This uh, the website. You know the the two websites, JoeCamp.info and and Soulofhorse.com. Our contact info is on both of them. We'll and, have that on the show notes for sure. And you can you can you can use the website or you use the phone numbers. You know you've got the both the cell number and the regular number. And it does. And I, I encourage people who are getting into it, and you can tell that it's they they need some good coddling. And so I, I try to answer their questions, and then I say if you got you know if you want to talk some about all this, just give me a call. And so if they get a time where they can do a call, then they'll put it in there and I'll send the number back and I'll talk to them. And Kathleen hates it when I, when I do that because, <laughs> because I'll spend two hours talking to these people about one little thing that they're going to, going to do, but they wind up loving their horse instead of just training their horse. Well, you, you are a treasure. And I, I I am I have long been honored to be your friend. And I, I I you you are using my words at all. I say it all. So I eat breakfast with you a lot during the week, and and it's it's a blessing just to be able to smile that big and go out with it on my face. <laughs> you do you 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 migrate it to 
to do that. And I'm so tickled that you come to Nashville every once in a while. Well, I, I am going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to connect. We're going to connect up there real soon. I'm just That's telling great. you. And love tell it, Kathleen, I won't take too much of your time so she won't be mad at me. No, I'm not mad. <laughs> as, as Kathleen will tell you, who's hiding over there in the corner, she, uh, you know, just, don't get Joe started. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, buddy. Thank you for being with us. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Chew toys for the cast and crew by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional funding provided by RealisticMammalCostumes.com. Friends, when's the last time you watched an animal movie? Lassie, Benji, Gentle Ben, and Flipper seem to be relics of a distant past. Why not make your own independent film? After all, Mad Max was made for less than $200,000 and made $98 million at the box office. The Blair Witch Project was made for $35,000 and made $248 million. Now it's your turn to rake in the big bucks. Animal movies are where it's at, and at RealisticMammalCostumes.com, we're here to get you started. Don't worry about the time it takes to train an actual animal, all the expense of rabies vaccinations, and legal protection from animal rights groups. Just rent a realistic mammal costume from us. Zip your kid inside and roll camera. How do you think it's done in the big leagues? Lassie, a preschooler from Baltimore. Flipper, a skinny Hispanic youngster from Miami Beach. Want to get your child in show business? An online visit to realisticmammalcostumes.com and you're halfway home. Try out our newest offerings created to fit third graders and below. Sammy the Sloth, Polly Possum, and Ham Hawk, our adorable pot-bellied pig, or any one of more than 40 choices. That's realisticmammalcostumes.com, not just for Halloween, but for a whole new career in filmmaking.